All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at Venture Cafe for another virtual artist studio tour. My name is Angela McQuillan, and I'm the curator at the Esther Klein Gallery at the Science Center in Philadelphia, which is also home to Venture Cafe. Tonight, we're going to get to take a look inside the studio of Philadelphia-based artist Heather Ugier. Her work is a synthesis of painting, drawing, stitching, and innovative large format digital printing technology. So Heather was born in New York City and currently lives in Philadelphia. She holds degrees in visual art, art education, and also textile surface design. Heather has over 15 years of experience as a textile designer, designing printed textiles for the high-end home furnishing and apparel markets in New York City. Um, her commercial printed textile designs have had numerous clients, including the White House, private residencies for President Do George W. Bush and Laura Bush in Washington, DC. She's also designed costumes for experimental theater and dance in New York City and has exhibited her artwork across the United States. Um, Heather currently teaches at Moore College of Art and Design where she serves as an interdisciplinary assistant professor in fashion, textiles, interior design and foundation design. So I just want to mention, we'll be taking questions in the chat throughout Heather's presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end where you can ask her questions directly. So now I will hand it over to Heather. Thank you so much, Angela and Emily, for all the tech support and for a wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to all of you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for setting aside the time tonight. Um, so I'm going to switch to my presentation right now, hopefully. Let's see if I can get this up and running. Okay, so can everybody see this? Okay, excellent. Um, so I have kind of a formal presentation planned, and I'm going to outline my uh, background, which Angela talked a little bit about, and my process, and... Um, a lot of the inspiration for my art and some of the shows that I've had. Um, so let me just get started. Okay, can everybody see this? Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, this talk is kind of about the cross-pollination between art and design. And as you all know, I'm an artist, designer, and educator. Um, so a lot of my work is large scale, um, digitally printed on different substrates from cotton to canvas to linen. And I utilize uh, this technology to create these really big installation pieces. This is a picture from uh, the last solo show I had at Rowan University Art Gallery. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is that although I use a lot of digital technology and some of my material investigations like laser cutting and fashion and digital printing and textiles, I also do a tremendous amount of hand painting. And painting is actually my first love. And this is a recent piece that was at the Art and Design Salon Fair uh, at the Park Avenue Armory in New York City. Um, and this was in 2019. And all of the individual elements in this panoramic landscape are actually all hand painted with gouache. And gouache is traditionally a paint that's used for textiles historically. Um, and I learned how to paint uh, with gouache at FIT when I was a student. And from there, I've used it in my studio practice to illustrate uh, different flora and fauna and all kinds of imagery. Um, and a lot of the uh, themes that run throughout my work have a lot to do with biodiversity and the uh, impeding Anthropocene and our kind of complex uh, relationship with nature. And in this uh, panoramic landscape, you can kind of see that the animals have their revenge uh, on humanity. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see human body parts, severed limbs, um, and hearts and so forth. Um, and I kind of love that juncture of looking at something beautiful and not realizing how grotesque it is or the, the symbolism behind that. So this was part of the Salon Art and Design Show. It was, um, I was uh, invited by the Wexler Gallery in Philadelphia and it was a wonderful opportunity because I had the chance to kind of collaborate with them to create this space. Uh, and they featured a lot of the other craftspeople and artists and designers um, from their gallery. Um, and the work was really large scale. 
as you could see, it's about uh, 260 inches wide by about three, uh, I think it's almost three yards high. Um, and it really worked uh, successfully with all the other artwork in the installation. And this fair kind of features um, products and art and uh, for like um, architects and interior designers, uh, they go to these shows to select objects uh, for the interiors. Um, so it was really exciting to have that experience. And then just to outline my process of briefly, I do paint with gouache. And if you can imagine the scale of this, this is a 20 by 30 sheet of watercolor paper. And this is a giant flower. So a lot of my process, I'm painting, um, I'm using a lot of historic references at times, 19th century illustrations of flora and fauna, um, anatomy studies I'm often looking at. And as I paint, um, I, I really enjoy this kind of um, very quiet process of just being in the studio and working at my desk. And then eventually, um, what many people don't realize as well is all the different processes that lead up to these digitally printed fabric pieces. So it starts with my research and my painting and then I scan in all my work at a very high resolution. Um, and then once I scan it in, I create these compositions digitally. So those of you who are a little more savvy digitally, one file could be like three gigabyte, um, which is huge, but I often work half scale and then later blow it up. And then also this, this process, I, before I even get to the fabric print, I actually print on plotter paper first. So these were printed at Moore College of Art and Design, and this is, just my scaled up work as a test print, as a kind of prototype to see the scale and the color. And this is just 36 inch wide generic plotter paper. It's kind of low quality, but it's my way of kind of testing it out. And that's even before I outsource it to digitally print. And then once I do that, I print it on fabric uh, in yardage. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly go over my bio. Um, as mentioned, I grew up uh, to a family of artists in Greenwich Village, and I never really realized how bohemian my childhood was until I left New York City. And my dad was uh, an educator, both my parents are painters, um, and I have a broad background. Um, when I was younger, I studied dance and I was very involved in theater. I was taking dance classes at least three times a week. So I was kind of surrounded by the performing and visual arts. And back in the day in New York City before Chelsea, those of you who remember, um, it used to be Soho was the place to go. And my parents were always showing there and taking us to um, museums and galleries um, all around Manhattan. So I, I feel now in retrospect, that was like going to school really. I mean, the, my childhood was spent going to dance performances, going to museums and galleries, going to crazy openings with all my crazy parents' friends. And um, so it was, it was really, um, a wonderful childhood to educate me about the arts. Um, after I graduated with my first degree, I started costume designing uh, since I knew so many dancers and performance artists. And I did a lot with avant-garde theater. I spent a whole year actually working at Juilliard where I was in the costume shop, like basically learning how to construct 17th century corsets for Moliere plays. So it was a really interesting time for me. Um, and then later I realized I couldn't make a living in the um, underground art scene. So I went back to school and learned how to design prints for the industry. And I started designing prints for home furnishing and fashion. And then it wasn't until the year 2000 after moving to Philadelphia and Bucks County that I really just started to go back to my roots in art. And this is a really um, nostalgic picture. This is me, with the dark hair right there. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom and my dad and my younger sister and I have one sister missing and this is in my mom's studio in our loft in Greenwich Village. You can see all the oil brushes and paint and this big blur in the foreground is actually our family dog and believe it or not his name was Oedipus. And so when I, I never realized this until later in life and I tell this story a lot but like whenever we used to go to a public place or the beach and one of us would call out Oedipus, you know, people would always look at me funny and I didn't realize <laughs> until much later that, you know, this was my father's um, 
kind of humor. He's really an intellectual and um, he named our dog Oedipus basically. So my dad was um, part of the abstract expressionist movement back in the day and um, in later in life he was showing in Soho and he was an amazing educator and teacher. He taught at Pratt and Brooklyn College um, and he was a really big influence on me. Um, and then after I got out of school, I moved to the East Village and I started designing costumes for, as I said, avant-garde theater and dance. And this is way back in the day, this is gonna really date me, but um, those of you who remember Walkman, Sony Walkmans, this, um, co these costumes were inspired by Sony Walkmans when they first came out. Now it's the iPhone is the rage, but um, I was very interested in just kind of um, designing something that would allude to this kind of technology that was evolving. Um, I did a lot of work with um, a choreographer whose name was Kenneth King, and he was actually a contemporary of Merce Cunningham. And um, he was also known, um, I don't know if he's still alive, but he, he was a mentor to me. He hired me as an unknown maverick kid right out of school. I had no experience. I was just hanging out in the East Village and he took a chance on me. And um, I started uh, designing costumes for many of his productions. Um, and he was also a philosopher uh, and a scholar. And he wrote a lot of books on uh, dance. This is one of his uh, published books, Writing in Motion, Body, Language and Technology by Kenneth King. And it was, has a forward by Deborah Jewett, who was big in the Times for reviewing dance, at least at the time. Um, and what's interesting is he was real a visionary in terms of performance uh, in integrating video and technology at the time. This is way before the internet. Um, and so he liked to uh, really kind of uh, reference science and technology a lot and engineering. And one of his pieces I designed got reviewed for the Times. This was in the 80s. And it was a piece inspired by Buckminster Fuller. Um, so that was pretty for a kid right out of school, that was pretty amazing that I had that opportunity to work with him. Um, later, I found that I really couldn't make a living as an avant-garde costume designer. I was bartending and um, I had a pretty kind of underground life. And I went back to school and I learned textile print design and then I ended up working in the industry for about 15 years. So I was working in the home furnishing market. Um, I was designing prints for bedding, for furniture. Um, I learned how to, to uh, design patterns and repeat. Uh, I also worked in the apparel market and designed prints for fashion. Um, but one thing I found with all of this is I, after a while, I just felt like I wasn't actualizing my potential. I was making lots of money. I had a very glamorous life, but I felt really empty and I wanted to get away from the industry. And then when my partner and I moved to Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to change my life again and become an educator and focus more on art. But before we left New York in the early 2000s, I started showing more art, kind of arty wall coverings, kind of engineered types of uh, wallpaper that's uh, less commercial and flavor paper is a great place in Brooklyn. Uh, they produce award-winning wallpaper. This is the outside. Uh, it's a beautiful showroom. And they also produce, they work with the Andy Warhol Museum now to reproduce a lot of digital, digitally printed uh, Warhol, Warhol wall coverings. Uh, but yeah, I, they still to this day um, represent me and sell my work. Um, and it's sold by the yard and the foot um, for um, storefronts or domestic spaces and the like. So uh, flavor paper is a really fun place to visit. So when I think about myself and myself as an artist, um, it's a real creative journey and I kind of feel like it's been a cycle. And uh, for me, my art and design has been kind of flux back and forth. And I'm always examining kind of the microcosm of pattern in terms of networks and nature and also the macrocosm of meaning how those things reflect back to my spirituality or the world. Um, and for me, my creative journey, I think, is universal for all of us. Um, you know, we always, I think if you're a really innovative artist or if you strive to create interesting work, you're always asking questions. 
And, you know, who are we? Where do we come from? What is the importance of our community? Can we share a common humanity? What happens after we die? How do we find love and truth? Are we alone or is there a spirit world? And do we dare to dream and face the unknown? Um, these are questions that we all struggle with. And especially now when we think about the duality between the external and the internal world, right now we're living in the most complex time in history with the COVID-19 pandemic, with political and economic crisis in America, climate change, global warming, um, devastation of our ecological systems of air and water and plant life. We li we're living in the Anthropocene, the mass extinction of animal species. It's just overwhelming to think about, you know, and even now all the social and racial and gender unrest and inequality. So, so how do we make sense of that? It's for all of us, it's such a challenge. And so for me, doing my art is my opportunity to find spiritual affinities to nature, to be creative, to share my, uh, to share global mythologies, um, to look into other cultures around the rural world, think about their narratives and their stories and how they relate back to my personal life. Um, and education has really saved my soul. Being an educator um, makes me feel like I'm giving back. Uh, I think empathy is a key word here right now more than ever that we all need empathy to enable us to have self-determination and social engagement. And then finally, you know, we need to be open to diversity and take risks and overcome obstacles. Um, and I'm a firm believer in folk, folk tales and um, kind of global mythologies from Greek to Persian mythologies around finding heroes and heroines. I find those stories uh, really resonate with me. So when we look at the world and we look within ourselves, there, there is definitely um, ways that we can find um, common denominators, um, not only in terms of like structuring of a cell or um, of a pattern, but also um, just the spiritual affinities that we share. And I love Charles and Ray Eames, um, who were some of the most um, important American designers of the 20th century. Um, and they designed all kinds of things from uh, textiles to product to furniture to architecture. And there's a wonderful film which um, came out many years ago, which is a classic called The Powers of Ten, uh, which basically um, deals with everything is connected in nature from um, energy and art and design. And it kind of, um, it's a low tech film that I'm gonna actually show a little film clip of. Um, I'm only gonna show a couple minutes of it, but it, it really to me is one of these um, innovative films that came out in the 70s that really set the stage for understanding the journey of uh, what it is to be an artist and designer and kind of um, look at the world around you. Um, so um, hopefully I'll be able to go and you'll be able to hear this. I'm gonna try this now. And uh, can you hear this? Not really. No, okay. I think you have to unshare your screen and then reshare your screen and um, check the share computer audio box. Yes, I think you're right. So, so I'm gonna stop sharing, right? Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna go, what am I gonna do? Oh. You're gonna share screen again, but when the window pops up, there's just a little check box and it says, Share computer audio. On October. We begin with a scene one meter wide. Which we view from just one meter away. Okay. Now every 10 seconds. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I feel retro feeling this film has. Interesting. And this was produced by IBM. The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. 
This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, the distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway, power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10. So um, anyway, I'm not gonna play the whole film, but what's wonderful about it is it just kind of, um, now do I need to, can you see my screen now? If yes. Back to, okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So um, the wonderful thing about this film is that it really speaks to this notion how everything in life is connected from when we view outer space and all the planets and the galaxies. And then every 10 meters, the camera comes back in to Earth till eventually you see this close up of the human hand. And we actually go inside of the human hand and see the blood cells and the molecules. And that it kind of creates this parallel between the outer world and the inner world. And to me, that's a very profound concept. And I love to kind of explore that in my work. So multiplicity patterns, networks, and spirituality, these are all things that interest me. And um, oftentimes in my work, it's very interesting to me that I became a textile designer because textiles is all about patterning and motif making. Like when we examine cell structures in nature, seed pods and molecules, um, there's something really, really um, interesting about that and how that relates to a much larger scale of viewpoint of the universe. So nature is very important to me. Um, and you know, if we're examining uh, leaf structures or coral, um, or we're looking at um, like Buckminster Fuller's work, which was all about the geodesic domes and trying to create sustainable uh, environments, um, a lot of this is based on structures in nature. Um, I'm often in my own work um, sh looking at architecture and fashion and other areas outside of um, art. And this is an amazing, uh, the Chinese pavilion. This was designed in 2010 by Thomas Heatherwick. This is, you can actually go inside this structure. Um, and those are lucite rods that are um, embedded in that structure and in, in each of the lucite rods he embedded these seeds um, so it's really um, to me this is the kind of stuff that excites me and interests me and I'm always looking at other artists work uh, whether it's contemporary or historic like Tara Donovan her work is all about multiplicity and patterning um, and I, I really love what she does with her material investigations uh, Yoyoi Kazuma and her obsession with polka dots, um, and um, um, also Maiko Takeda, her work, um, which her these fashion experimental fashion pieces look like giant seed pods. Um, so for me, step was somebody going to say something? No, okay. So for me, stepping outside of um, just like traditional art and doing research is very invigorating. Um, so it all, if I think back to starting these panoramic um, uh, textile installations, it really kind of all traces back to Zuber, uh, which was founded in 1797. And it's one of the most amazing um, uh, woodblock printing wallpaper companies to this day. It still exists in France. Um, and you may be familiar with these amazingly beautiful panoramic uh, wall coverings that allude to these kind of romantic landscapes and they're very, um, is, there is a lot of atmospheric perspective and it's a high-end wall covering company that makes um, these, uh, these are actually hand block printed and on paper. Um, and they, they oftentimes sell to high-end clients. I know they have some of their installations in the White House and various estates. But I, I think the magic of these, um, these wallpapers really kind of ignited my imagination. Um, also in the history of textiles, I've always loved tree of life patterns. 
from the 17th century on. And I just find those really interesting and almost surreal in the way they combine flora and fauna and kind of these really interesting abstracted motifs. Uh, which are used, you know, tree of life patterns are used in interior design to this day. Um, but to me, they also can represent um, more symbolic meanings like in Gustav Klimt's work. Um, and also I love the work of Fred Tomaselli, who often um, embeds um, seeds and all kinds of things into his, his paintings um, and is always kind of referencing these different patterns in his work. So when I talk about my own work, I guess it's very important for me to, to honor the artists and the designers around me that I'm looking at. And of course, um, Hilma Off Klint's show is incredible. Um, visionary artist who really um, created these amazing large scale paintings that to me, these are like giant seed pods, um, but actually she had a whole mathematical system of coding of how she um, kind of created uh, her work. Um, and I'm always looking at everything outside of me. I'm not a painter, but I, I see, like I look at Carrie James Marshall work, and when I look at this, to me, this is an amazing composition of pattern and color and such a celebration of life. And, um, I, you know, I really struggled during the pandemic, one of the major reasons being three quarters of my time, I go to museums and galleries. That's what I love to do. I love to see art and I love to see shows. And I feel so isolated that I haven't been able to um, get out there and really um, look at great art and design. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just would like to celebrate all the artists that have influenced me like Hockney and others. So in, as far as themes in my work, um, you know, I am definitely interested in multiplicity and patterns, but I'm also interested in dualities and juxtaposition between different ideas like violence and love and beauty and the grotesque, as I mentioned. And I think what really um, got me started way back in the day when I was a teenager in Manhattan was going to the cloisters and actually seeing the unicorn tapestries. Um, in person and having had that experience of seeing these amazing narratives that are kind of outlining the human condition of like, you know, good versus evil or, um, you know, just these, these narratives and stories of, of that we carry with us. Um, to me, these are very uh, profound and the fact that this was a tapestry and a textile, I think really had an impact on me. Also Frida Kahlo's work, which of course is very much celebrating the human spirit of survival and overcoming obstacles and also questioning notions around gender and male and female um, and pain and suffering and beauty, you know, all of those things kind of working together in her work. Um, and then I'm always researching for all my classes and I just stumbled across the work of Jana Sturbeck, uh, Jana Sturbeck, I think it's pronounced, and she was a an late 80s artist who actually created this feminist piece. Uh, it was called The Meat Dress, and it was meant to be performative, but it is still in a museum somewhere. And it was all about how we view women as meat, uh, and it's very engaging and disturbing. And I think it's really funny that she created this 20, 30 years ago, and then lo and behold, here's Lady Gaga, uh, wearing this meat dress in a performance and receiving this award. So to me, this kind of flux back and forth between art and design, between high and low, between pop culture and um, history, I find that really engaging and I really celebrate all of it. Um, and so I've mentioned the Anthropocene. Ernest Haeckel has become very well known recently. Um, his botanical and scientific studies are amazing. And I've revisited them many times in my own work as sources of inspiration for, you know, he cataloged a lot of endangered species now. Um, and I often look to uh, a lot of these illustrations for inspiration. Um, and then also Robert Maplethorpe, um, this idea that we can celebrate not only the human spirit, but the body and our sexuality. Um, I, I love the work of so many different artists that I feel are embracing that, like Wangechi Mutu. I think she had a show in the last couple of years in Philadelphia, embracing what it is to be female and the plight of uh, the obstacles that we all face. and um, 
I, I just love her paintings. I think they're really amazing. And of course, um, again, celebrating the erotic, what better way than a giant octopus? <laughs> uh, but this is a, a print by um, Hokisai, uh, which I have actually used as a source of inspiration in my work as well. And I love Egon Schiele's work. So for me to celebrate history is to celebrate my life. Um, I spent a whole summer reinterpreting Andrea Mantega's uh, print from the mid 1400s. And I actually redrew this entire thing. It took me the entire summer to render it with pen and ink and wash. And this in turn became a huge installation piece that was digitally printed on fabric and then shown in the Racine Museum. So, um, you know, I, I really love contextualizing a lot of what I do. Um, and then it all begins with painting. So painting with gouache, um, these were tree of life patterns that I, I start with one repeat unit and then I scan them in and then I'm able to put them into patterns in repeat. And this was in the Rowan University art show. It was all hand painted. Um, and then I digitally print, I do test prints on fabric and paper. Um, I use um, different materials from uh, polyester to linen to cotton. Um, and then um, a lot of this now is outsourced. Uh, for those of you who do wanna do an on-site tour, Jefferson University has the most amazing state-of-the-art facility in digital printing technology for textiles. And my husband is an expert in the field and he created a multi-billion dollar um, uh, research lab there. And you can go and visit and see what they do. And it's really, really incredible. Um, but these are just some of what the machines look like. They print unlimited yardage on rolls. So that's how my uh, installations come into being. Um, there are many different uh, types of printers. So here's some of those. This was printed on self-adhesive vinyl. And this was the wallpaper I just showed you. And this was some of the installation for the show. Another piece of equipment that he has there, which is really, if you wrap your mind around it, those of you who screen print, this is pretty amazing. This is a flatbed digital printer. So what that means is it's not printing on a roll of fabric, it's actually digitally printing on a hard substrate like a door. Um, and so what you can do now is you can print with infinite amounts of colors without any screens. Um, so it's really, really incredible uh, what's available now. So again, going back to textiles, looking at historic documents, reinterpreting things that inspire me um, and um, creating motifs. And then from those motifs, creating patterns and repeat or even digitally printing on a plate. I did a whole series of digitally printed plates uh, which were based on those designs. Um, and again, going back to themes in my work around of these dualities in nature of um, the volatile versus, um, you know, what is what we embrace um, of like, you know, monsters and demons versus cell structures and birth and wombs. Um, this was this image I created, which became part of this huge installation. This was digitally printed on velvet. And then this huge piece was uh, part of a big exhibit that was at the Hunterton Art Museum. Um, you can see in the background, I did this giant paper uh, kind of woman warrior. Um, that was really fun. That piece doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. So celebrating nature, celebrating the erotic, uh, celebrating the human spirit, thinking about fantasy and the sublime and the kind of dream world. Those are the kinds of things that excite me. Um, and this notion of kind of hybridization of thinking of how to combine animal and human forms. I did a whole series of homoerotic uh, illustrations and that in turn, uh, those illustrations became part of a giant tree of life. And that in turn uh, was part of this show that I had at the uh, Philadelphia Art Alliance. And um, this has been reproduced as wallpaper and as fabric installations. And this was part of a show uh, called Erotic Alchemy um, in 2014. And I was looking at a lot of Renaissance art at the time and kind of creating this um, dream world installation inside the historic uh, premises of the Art Alliance. And so this whole room became this 
very kind of dreamlike landscape with a couch was designed by um, R.J. Thornburg. Um, and when you walked into this interior, uh, basically there was a soundtrack of birds singing on a loop. So when you walked in, it sound, you know, the, you could hear birds kind of chirping and the sound of water. So it was really transformative as far as an environment. Um, and then most recently, I was really inspired by Hieronymus Bosch and his Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, this is such an incredible painting. I could just study this for 10 years. <laughs> I mean, just all the different um, scenes and narratives and the beauty of uh, the paintings and the symbolism and, and just there's so much in here to examine. Um, and I designed a fountain that was actually based on this structure um, for the show um, depicting Adam and Eve. Um, but I did my own series of paintings that were inspired by this. And then this became part of the uh, solo show Terra Incognita. Um, and I created all kinds of, this was a very ambitious show. This, this show actually comprised three-dimensional work, a water fountain, uh, a quilt, textile installations. And in this case, um, this kind of started me off getting much more involved in material investigations in my 2D work. So I started going back into my digital printed fabrications and manipulating the surfaces with paracord and embroidery and sequins and faux fur. Uh, and I really started to um, engage more with dimensionality and with creating um, uh, sculptures and an environment in the space. So this piece became huge and I grommeted the surface of the entire piece. And then from those grommets, I suspended paracord um, that kind of hung out into uh, the environment. Um, so yeah, a lot of the images that were digitally printed on the fabric were from paintings I had done. I created this kind of environment uh, fantasy world uh, with this giant creature um, I don't even know. Some people said he looked like a dragon. Um, I, I got all different kinds of commentary on this piece, but um, this was actually, I, I really tried to be playful. So these are the brightly colored paracord and I used um, zip ties, uh, colored zip ties and uh, rubber tubing. Um, and I was looking at a lot of avant-garde fashion. A lot of times I'm, as I'm researching and looking at the world around me, I'm looking at uh, all different forms of art and design. And I really do like to honor the world around me and showcase what's a, what are the kinds of things that inspire me. And I ended up actually designing all these fashion designs for this show. And then in the end, I didn't, they, they didn't become fashion. They actually evolved into sculptures. So um, this piece, which is this beautiful kind of a uh, quature experimental garment turned into this hybrid creature, uh, which uh, was all made out of like vacuum hoses and zip ties and sequins and um, 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 all kinds of experimental materials. And the piece on the left was originally going to be a garment evolved into this kind of creature uh, that looked kind of like a hybrid creature of sorts. And then this piece on the right, which I was thinking of creating as a garment, turned into a fountain, believe it or not. Um, and I actually engineered and designed the fountain. I know nothing about engineering, but I somehow figured it out. And Mary Savanti, who's the curator of Rowan University, helped me. So if you look at this, the pump is down here. It's inside a, a tub of water. The water goes up through this totem, back down through the uh, vinyl tubing that is attached to the top of the sculpture. Um, and this was this whole labor intensive process where I used um, swim noodles and I taped them together. I covered them with yarn. Uh, we started, this is really funny. We tested it out in a doggy bathtub to see if it was gonna work. Um, and then I used a paracord and a zigzag uh, on my sewing machine and I took the white paracord and created these kind of surrealistic fantasy um, kinds of uh, shapes and forms. I spent hours and hours covering um, swim noodles with 
yarn and I actually, um, and this is a, a zip ties and boning. Uh, this is actually, if you've ever made a corset, you know that boning uh, is what keeps the corset uh, straight and tight. And I was able to cut the boning and create these kind of multiple shapes that look like cell structures. And then this was the final uh, fountain sculpture. And I, um, I actually, one of, um, there's an artist friend of mine who took a video of this. This was the centerpiece for the exhibit. And then, you know, there was so much, I can't believe I did this all on my own. It took me two years to create the entire show. Uh, and I, I did have some of my students help me with this. Um, but this is what, these are some of the pieces that I don't, to, I don't know how to identify these pieces. I don't know whether to call them sculptures or art to wear pieces, um, but whatever they are, it's something I'm interested in evolving uh, more. Um, so I had all my students make 150 felt circles, which became part of the uh, structure of this creature on the outside. Um, and then I created this kind of surrealistic flora and fauna um, and on and on. And here, hopefully I can show this. Um, the reason I wanna show this video is um, you can actually hear the sound of the water, which I love. So it was a really great space to design, and I must find her. One thing I always do is I make my work site specific. So I get all the specs of the gallery. I design each piece to fit on each wall. And then I really design the work around the space. Uh, and that's what I was able to do. Um, so every surface is covered. I covered the windows. Um, I built the, the uh, central piece of the fountain. And then there was like a garden um, in one corner where you can see uh, this creature. And um, sorry. Um, so to end things, um, let me just finish up here. Sorry, I'm talking on and on and on. Um, hold on, I just need to go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so, oops. So what's next? <laughs> Finally, I'm finishing up. What's next? Well, I did have, I was really lucky to have the opportunity to be invited to Hotbed Gallery for a solo show this March. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, I felt I needed to cancel it because I just didn't feel like it's a good time to have this show. Um, so I'm hoping that we can still have it in 2021. And what's wonderful about Hotbed Gallery is that the owners are very involved in horticulture. So Brian Hoffman is a horticulturist and I'm hoping that when uh, I do this solo show that he can collaborate with me with a lot of the plants and kind of design the space to engage with my work. So I'm hoping that comes to fruition and it's a huge space, uh, space so I'm hoping that I can make it site specific. And then this piece, and I'll just skip over this because we're running out of time. Um, I'm basing this solo show on the epic tale of Shaname, which is a Persian um, story about um, basically the history of Persia and the invasion of the Islamic Empire. And there are all these wonderful um, pieces that I'm looking at right now that inspire my own work uh, that I'm really trying to kind of reinterpret and re-engage with. Um, and I, I started to paint in the studio this summer, inspired by a lot of uh, the visual iconography of that time. And um, I'm going to make this huge landscape, a few different landscape, panoramic landscapes. So again, I paint first and all of this is going to be scanned in. Um, and there's going to be all this different flora and fauna scanned into uh, one huge installation. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping I can kind of show the dualities of beauty and pain and, you know, just kind of speak to the human condition. So this is a, a rough draft. Um, this is just a little mock-up of how I envision this. So this will be all printed on fabric. And I've done a couple of different 
I always do little digital renderings as um, just in the beginning to kind of figure out my uh, compositions. So I did one for night and one for day. I'm not sure where this is going to go, uh, but this is just the rough beginning. Um, and then finally, to end this presentation with one of my favorite quotes, um, I just wanted to share that the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious, and it is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and science. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Heather. That was amazing. <laughs> Very informative, and I, I love your work so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have time for a studio tour, so maybe, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, if you want to take us for a little walkthrough, just so we can, you know, kind of see what your space looks like, where you make all these beautiful creations. Okay, let me see if I can. So if I turn my camera this way, can you, um, I think Emily. Uh, let, me, um, let me fix your camera. Let's see. Okay, so right yeah, now you, you can see I have some, I don't know what to call these. This is a new journey for me. I'm creating these big sculptural installations. This is kind of a, a giant female ram with horns and she is made out of boning and paracord and she's suspended from the ceiling. Unfortunately in my studio, the ceiling is kind of low. So I see this hanging uh, much, much um, higher and you can kind of see some of the uh, material play that I've done. Um, I also have, a, I'm building a lot of masks right now. And this is uh, made out of uh, rubber cording. And then this is boning for the corsets I told you about. This is zip ties. This was an old garment, not an old garment, but this was an experimental fashion piece I've made with laser cutting technology. These are all acrylic pieces that are hand sewed onto the skirt. And I'm kind of revisiting this and trying to combine it with this headpiece. So we'll see where that goes. I have no idea where that's going. Um, in case I didn't mention it, I, um, I love global culture and I am a fiend with books. And I have a huge library. Wow. <laughs> Uh, I, it's just part of, I love research and I really want to go back to school to get a PhD, but I just don't have time. And I always tell my husband, I just, I wish that I could because I just love research and I love um, thinking about everything. <laughs> but anyway, um, here's a new piece. Now this. Uh oh, I think we lost her for a minute. They're, this side isn't finished, but this is made with those felt. Um, I have a kind of neck piece on here with paracord. Um, and this is a Heather, we're losing you. Can you hear me? Hear me? Yeah, well, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, what I would love to do is if I have another show coming up, I'd love to find a way to invite a dance company or performance group to actually. Um, oh, no. <laughs> You're coming in and out. I think if you move a little bit back, we could hear you better. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Well, I won't go that far in my studio, but anyway, I don't know if you can see this, but you can see part of my studio here. Yeah. So wait, you were saying that you were envisioning it on a dancer? And somehow collaborate with a theater. So we'll see where that goes. Um, and then here's the wall where I hang up. Can you guys see this? Yeah. They're my paintings. Um, these are what I worked on all summer. Um, and some of the images, as you can see, is very, uh, are very provocative, but that's the juncture I'm interested in is, you know, the violence and the beauty of what you see. They're very intricate. Do you, 
like, do you create sketches before you do these? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. So um, I actually haven't showed you any, but um, I'll, I, I draft out uh, definitely a big sketch and I'm looking at um, a lot of research, like historic research, and then I'm kind of data mashing everything together. And yeah. That's amazing. So we have a question. Um, what aspect of your work do you sell? Say that again? What aspect of your work do you sell? Like you do so many different objects and yeah. Did you say so? Sell, like S-E-L-L. -L. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm actually really, to be very honest, I'm really struggling with selling my work. Mm -hmm. um, I find that, you know, I just recently hooked up with Wexler Gallery and um, they've been trying to kind of promote my work more towards um, architecture and interior designers and maybe public art. Um, but I, I find that a lot of, I feel like my viewers in the art world, they, they don't how, know how to kind of categorize my work. It's not really one or the other, it's kind of a combination of things. And so I feel like I've made some really good sales, um, like with the convention center and a couple of museums have bought my pieces, but struggling to market myself as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I just, because I kind of um, don't have a specific niche that I fit into, um, I feel like maybe it's it's hard to kind of interpret where my work would go. But in my mind, I see my work in public spaces, like yeah. I see it in the like a lobby of a hotel. Mm -hmm. um, and I just haven't made that breakthrough with um, someone to promote me um, for that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a challenge to sell my work, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then also I have my painted pieces. I, had, I do have to say the Wexler Gallery recently has been selling some of my uh, 20 by 30 paintings. They've been framing them and sending the, selling them that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes it kind of, it wasn't until the last five years that I actually started framing my work and showing it along with my textile installations as artwork unto itself. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple questions here. Uh, is it possible to buy the bedspread in your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. That was like years ago in the industry. <laughs> but I can, um, yeah, I mean, as a designer, oftentimes I will, I don't, like some artists might feel uncomfortable designing something to a client's needs. Um, I don't have a problem with that. So like if a client came to me and they said, oh, I want you to design and engineer a beautiful image of your work that will fit on my bed. I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, guess that, I guess that answers the next question. Do you work by commission? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah. 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 I, oh, but, airport. Yeah, I did have a show in the airport and I've often thought, oh God, if I could just have an installation in the airport, it's huge, right? Yeah. And you just opened that, right? Was that recent? The airport? Yeah. Um, no, I haven't actually, about, it was like 10 years ago I had oh. an installation. Um, okay. You know, rotating exhibits. Got it. Yeah. So I have a question for you. You grew up in New York City and spent a lot of time there, obviously. How do you feel like the local art scene in Philadelphia kind of compares? And I know you've been living here for like almost 20 years now. So um, what draws you to live in Philadelphia? Um, well, actually, our move from New York to Philadelphia was purely career and career driven. Um, my partner at the time got a full-time position. That's Hitoshi. This is before we were married. Um, he got a full-time position teaching at Philadelphia University, and now it's called Jefferson. But back then, it was called the Textile and Science Technology School. And his, we, uh, he's also, not anymore, but he used to work in the textile industry. So um, what he, when he moved from New York, basically, I just came with him. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't like a conscious decision on my part. It was more that we could stay together. But one thing that really did affect me, which I mentioned in my presentation, was I had a choice in my life. When I left New York, I could either start to develop, develop define myself as a textile print designer and create a whole series of textile prints and market myself as a textile designer. Or instead, I chose to get away from the commercial market and instead try to embrace my art background and start to do more art installations. So that was a conscious choice on my part and actually teaching, um, teaching enabled me to do that. So I was able to support myself and teach, um, and therefore I could focus uh, more my creative work in the summers and in, on my free time um, in the studio for my studio practice. Awesome. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions. If anyone wants to unmute their microphones and ask Heather anything directly or any comments. I'm trying to go through some of the comments now. You know, it's hard to pay attention with two things. <laughs> Um, yeah, you have a lot of compliments. Everyone wants to see your work in public spaces. Oh, uh, yeah. If anybody can help me out, you can uh, email me. It's on, go to my website. My email is on the website. Also, nowadays, the murals that, that they put on buildings are done with fabric. Yeah, I know Ben Volta does a lot uh, with digitally printing on a kind of vinyl substrate, and then he, I think he glues it to the surface mm -hmm. of buildings, and a lot of artists are doing that now. Yeah, Mural Arts is a place I've tried to kind of network with. I haven't made the right connection yet, but I would love to do something like that. Um, I definitely foresee my work going more into public spaces and larger scale on the outside and the inside of buildings. Yeah. Um, Definitely the sculpt sculptural pieces as well. Yeah, if I, if I can figure out how to make some of this work um, stand the test of time outside. Right now, a lot of the materials I'm working with for uh, those sculptures is really, you know, it has to be in an indoor space. Mm -hmm. um, but I love masks and I love the drama of mask making. And I was thinking it would be really fun to collaborate with uh, some kind of performance group or something. Yeah, definitely. Um, so with all of your reading and all your love of books and images and inspirations, how do you find a way to sort of categorize like all of these things that you're looking at and, you know, organize them or, you know, like, like it seems like you do a lot of research. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess um, uh, often what catches my eye is um, either it has it goes kind of goes back to I, I look at a lot of South Asian art and I also these days I'm looking at a lot of Persian art. Um, although I must say I've been obsessed with the Renaissance too. Um, but I, I think something that always captures my attention are these pivotal moments of conflict. Um, that when I'm looking at something as a, I do appreciate um, non-objective art uh, in terms of what it is, but I really prefer narratives and figurative work. Um, whether in every culture it's, you know, figures are stylized differently throughout time. But I always gravitate towards some kind of human conflict and or um, representations of love. So it's those dualities of conflict and embrace. Um, that's why the um, Harmonious Boss piece, I never say his name right, but um, the figures in that, uh, to me, I don't see it as a religious painting. I see it as kind of a commentary on the human condition of all the different variances of uh, relationships that we have with each other, whether it's, you know, food and sustenance, whether it's deception, whether it's love, whether it's um, our relationship with nature. I guess anything that shows me the, that from when, whatever century it's from or whatever, whatever period of time it's from, it has to, in some way, the work is representing the human condition. So that's what I latch on to are those narratives. Um, also, yeah. I, 
I guess from a fashion point of view, like I really love um, looking at a lot of experimental fashion design and thinking about design in a more kind of broad way, not so much uh, as functional design, but more kind of experimental design. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, did I answer your question? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. It's convoluted. There's so many things I could say in relation to that. Um, I also like a lot of, um, I don't know, it's, yeah, I mean, there was a period, it, every, I guess I'm, I keep changing my perspective. I never feel like I'm, I stay in one place. Like yeah. some artists, they develop an identity and they develop a language and it kind of stays within the same kind of genre. Whereas I feel like with my work, I'm kind of always morphing and changing and finding, trying to find ways to interconnect things and make connections. It means you have a lot of curiosity. <laughs> oh yeah, that actually is true. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. This was amazing. There were so many colors and textures and patterns and your work is so elegant and thought provoking. Um, as an artist, I'm feeling really inspired by all of your imagery of your work. So thank you so much for, for being with us tonight.